I'm continually amazed how often in my work of evangelization the problem of Genesis comes up. What I mean is people that are just balking over what seems to be the bad science on display in the book of Genesis. They say, look, how can you possibly make sense of this text that says God made the world in six days, all the species came into being you know, roughly at the same time, that um, light existed before the sun and moon. I mean, come on. How do you square this very naive mythological cosmology with the subtle work of Newton and Einstein and, and Stephen Hawking? Genesis is just bad science. Who can take it seriously today? Well, here's a way to get at it. Uh, when looking at the Bible, and Vatican II is real clear on this, you've got to be sensitive to genre. What kind of text are we dealing with? See, and people make mistakes about that all the time. It would be a, it would be a mistake to look at Moby Dick and expect it to be uh, 19th century history. It would be a mistake to look at T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland and expect it to be a spy novel. You have to know what kind of text you're dealing with. So, what is Genesis? If I can borrow a page from uh, Father George Coyne, the great uh, Jesuit priest and, and uh, astrophysicist, he said, look, modern science commences in the uh, late 16th, early 17th century with uh, Galileo and Descartes and Pascal and company. The last biblical book is written around the year 100 AD. There's just no way that the Bible is modern science. Modern science didn't exist yet. So whatever's going on in the Bible, it's not what we mean by modern science. What Newton and Stephen Hawking and Einstein and company were doing is just simply not what the biblical authors are doing. Newton and company are following the um, uh, uh, ideas and, and principles of modern science, namely to observe, to uh, form hypotheses, to test them with experimentation, draw conclusions, etc. Okay. So don't look at Genesis as bad science. That's like looking at The Wasteland as a bad spy novel. It's not a spy novel at all. Genesis is not science at all. So what is it? I would call it um, theology, mysticism, spirituality. It's a theological reflection on the origin of all things. So what are some of the insights we can gain once we get this genre uh, issue clear? Well, there are many, many. Genesis is, is uh, so rich and so multivalent. I'll just pick out a, a couple. Here's the first one. God makes the whole world. Now, translate that philosophically, if you want, into the non-contingent ground of contingency gives rise to all things, even here and now. So creation's happening now. Genesis is talking theologically about something that's happening even now. God is giving rise to the world. How? How? Through a nonviolent act of speech, God says, let there be light, and there's light. God says, let the earth come forth, and it comes forth. In almost all the mythologies of the ancient world, all the ancient cosmologies, the world comes forth in a great act of violence. God or the gods um, uh, battle with some opponent. They wrestle a rival into submission, and in that act, order ensues. By the way, notice how that myth is very uh, prevalent, even to this day. We still tend to believe that order comes through um, violence, through the conquest of a rival. There's none of that, though, in Genesis. God brings forth the world not through violence, not through conquest, but through a sheerly generous, nonviolent act of speech. Link it now, if you want, to the great ethical teachings of Jesus about the love of enemies, about nonviolence. What he's recommending is not just a more correct ethical path. He's recommending to fall into line with the deepest grain of the universe that God makes the world through nonviolent love. There's a, a first theological theme in Genesis. Here's a second one. People of that time, the time the Bible was written, uh, worshipped all kinds of gods. Right? Some worshipped the uh, stars. Some worshiped the moon, some worshiped the sun, some worshiped animals, right? All these different features of creation were worshiped as gods. Now, what does the author of Genesis say? God created the heavens and the earth. God created the stars. God created the planets and the moon and the sun. God created all the animals. You see what he's doing is he is 
dethroning all these false claimants to divinity. He's saying none of these is in fact God, but they all come from God and they bear witness to God. But he's enunciating, if you want, a great anti-idolatry principle. Nothing in this world is God. The true God is the creator of all things. Relevant message today, you bet. I mean, we worship all kinds of things, you know, from pleasure to money to power, etc. No, no, God makes all those things. They're all under the aegis of God, but they're not to be worshipped. It's a second uh, theological point. Um, here's a third one, and again, I could pick many, many. It's such a rich text. Adam. Now, don't read it literally. We're not talking about a, a, a literal figure. We're talking uh, in theological poetry. Adam, the first human being, names all the animals. He catalogs them. Uh, katalogon in the Greek means according to the word. God has imbued all things with intelligibility. Adam, noticing the intelligibility, names them, gives them their proper title. Who is he? The church fathers read him as the first scientist. He's the first philosopher. He's the human being in his proper role as the steward of creation and the one who names and orders all things according to God's uh, creative intention. This is the great humanism that's implicit in Genesis. Eat of all the trees, right, we hear. The church fathers said that's the great permission of Genesis. Adam and Eve, who are kind of at play in, in the field of the Lord, that stands for science, for art, for politics, for conversation, for friendship, all these forms of human flourishing under the lordship of God. Genesis is a great humanistic text. Now, those are three insights. I could garner many, many more. Read great commentators on Genesis. Read the great spiritual and theological interpreters of it. Get over the problem of Genesis as bad science. It's not bad science. It's not science at all. Rather, it is exquisite theology.